Okay, so welcome to uh, lecture lecture six of the of the course on special relativity, electrodynamics, and general relativity. So in this in this lecture, we want to study acceleration and forces in in relativity. Okay, and we want to rethink uh, some of the failures of of uh, Newtonian mechanics and see that forces are going to be replaced by fields and understand the motivation for that. That's not done as a whim. That's done because relativity and locality push us in the direction of, uh, of fields where the, rather than forces. And we have to understand what, what do we mean by that. Well, keep in the back of your mind that a field is like the electromagnetic field. Okay, electric and magnetic effects. That's what we really have in mind. So I want to, I want to uh, get there in, in steps. I want to look at acceleration and I want to look at forces in uh, Newton's and Einstein's world. Well, acceleration in, in relativity will turn out to be relatively complicated, uh, but in Newton's world, of course, relatively, uh, in Newton's world, of course, acceleration is really important and really simple. Acceleration is important because F is equal to ma, and a is Galilean invariant, as we've discussed uh, a number of times. Okay, okay, and that's and that's really the firmament of Newtonian. Newtonian mechanics. Now, acceleration in relativity is going to be more more involved, and we're going to we're going to study it now. We want to understand whether it's Lorentz invariant. Right? We don't have Galilean transformations from one frame to the other anymore. We have Lorentz transformations. Okay, and so we want to ask the equivalent question that was answered in Newton's world: How does uh, the acceleration transform from one frame to another? Okay, so here I, I start off with my usual system of a frame S and a frame S prime moving to the right at velocity V. And in my frame S prime, I have a, I have a mass with, a, with velocities, and I write them as U primes, and I have velocities in the X, Y, and Z direction. And I want to calculate what U sub X, U sub Y, and U sub Z are in the frame, in the frame S, if I know them in the frame, uh, in the frame S prime. Okay, but that's, that's pretty easy to do because I've done the groundwork already. I know how velocities add or transform from one frame to the other. I have the velocity addition formulas. Okay, I'm writing them down here. So the, the velocity in the x direction is equal to the velocity in the x direction in the frame s prime plus the velocity of, of, of frame s prime with respect to s and then divided by uh, divided by the, uh, 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 the, the term that came up from relativity. It's from the, rel it's from the uh, relativity of simultaneity, as, as, we, as we've discussed, from the Lorentz transformations. And uh, it's the critical term in enforcing the speed limit between the two frames. So I'm just writing down, the, writing down that formula again. Nothing, not that, I'm not doing anything new at all. OK, and I've written it for the, for the x component of the velocity. And then in the transverse uh, components of the velocity, which I call the directions y and z, transverse to the, to the uh, direction x, which is the direction of the boost. And they're written down here. And you see they involve gamma, and they involve v, the relative velocities of the two frames. And they involve uh, a u prime x, the velocity of the particle, in the x direction in the frame s prime. OK, pretty complicated. Okay. But now, what do I want? I want the acceleration in, in, in the frame S. So I want the rate of change of u sub x with respect to time in the frame S. OK, well, I, I, I can do that. I can take differentials of, of, of these fellows. You see, the only thing that's variable are the u and the u primes. v is a constant, c is a constant. I can do that. And then I have to know what dt is, and I have to know dt in the in uh, the frame S prime and the frame S. But that's easy because I have the Lorentz transformation which, which transforms uh, uh, space and time measurements from one frame to the other. So here I'm just rem re remembering the Lorentz transformation that gets me T in terms of T prime and X prime. Okay, but you see here I want DT. And so let's take the differential of this expression. Okay, and I've done that, and I've done that here. The only variables are T prime 
an x prime, the other is a constant. Okay, but what about dx prime? Well, dx prime, that's, uh, that's the distance that the particle moves in the frame, s prime. So it's related to its velocity in, in, the, uh, in the frame, s prime. And if it's in the direction of x, it's u sub x prime. So I've just written that down there. So I substitute that in here. dt of prime comes out here. And I get dt is equal to gamma. And then one of these factors, 1 plus v u prime sub x over c squared times dt prime. It's a factor we see all the time. OK. And so that's, that's the relationship. OK, now, now be a little careful here. You see that you might have expected, well, time in the frame s prime is going to be related to time in the, in the frame s by time dilation. Ah, but, but watch out. Because we're looking at a moving a particle, a, a particle in the frame s prime that's moving. If it was at rest in s prime, then time dilation would work, right? Because that's like a clock at rest in s prime, and its and its uh, and its ticks are related to the ticks of the clock in the frame s by just time dilation. But here it's moving in in, in s prime, and it's moving in s, and so there's this additional this additional uh, a factor which is proportional, you see, to its velocity in the frame s prime. Don't forget that. Okay. Notice this, and I say that here, notice this n is moving in s prime, d and d t prime are not related by just time dilation, because the particle is moving in, in the frame s prime. And, uh, you know, and, and as you, you've done lots of problems in kinematics in, in, in the textbooks, you've seen effects like this in, in, in problems of spaceships, space capsules, and uh, rendezvous in, in, in space, and, and uh, uh, you know, light beams going between capsules and and uh, and, uh, and uh, rocket ships and and we've had we've seen effects like that already. Okay, so so you've seen it before and here it is in a fancy formula. That's all that's different here. Okay, so now I'm all set. Now I have all the, now I have all the ingredients. I can go back to this formula, okay, and and take the uh, and take the the differentials on both sides. There's a little bit of uh, of arithmetic to do in doing that because you see I have u prime, uh, u prime dependence here and then downstairs. So when I take the differentials, I'll get two terms. I'll do that algebra and I'll combine them and I'll get this this uh, formula here for d d of u in terms of d of u prime. Okay, I'll get I'll get a factor of gamma cubed here and I'll get a factor uh, in parentheses uh, squared. So so watch the details and and uh, check the details in the textbook. I don't want to do I don't want to do that arithmetic here. It's straightforward, but it's best something you do it do at your table. Okay, but now I'm all set because now I'll take this equation and divide by this equation so that I get du dt on one side, that's the acceleration in one frame, and on the other frame I'll get du prime dt prime, that's the acceleration in the other frame. So just take this equation, divide by this e equation and you see what you get. You got the acceleration is related to the acceleration prime, and as and as uh, we expected, they are not the same in both frames. They're related by a bunch of kinematic factors. There's like one over gamma cubed, and there's this other uh, a kinematic factor to the cubed. Okay, so now I, I have what I wanted, and I can apply it to various problems. And similarly, I can I can do the same thing for the acceleration in the y direction. That one's a li even a little bit more complicated. And I get this analogous expression for the acceleration in the z direction. The y and the z directions are both transverse to the to the uh, x direction, so that they share the same transformation mode. So if I write down one, I got the other. Okay, but let's look at this. It's rather rather curious. I see that acceleration in the y direction in frame s gets a non-trivial contribution from the from the acceleration in the y direction in the frame s prime with kinematic corrections. But I also get a, a, a contribution to the acceleration because the particle might be accelerating in the x direction. And that, and that uh, contribution is proportional to the velocity of the particle in the y direction in the frame s prime. So it's, it's, a, little, it's, it's a little bit complicated, indeed. And, uh, and the geometry of acceleration in, uh, in special relativity is certainly more complicated and intricate than that. In, uh, 
in Galileo's world. Sometimes you just need special cases of these formulas, and one of the special cases is that perhaps you know, the particle in the frame S prime is instantaneously at rest, so all the U primes are equal to zero. Right? Then some of these kinematic factors go away, okay? Okay, if, if the velocity if the velocity is, uh, of the particle is, uh, is zero in the movie frame S prime. And then you're just left with some gamma factors uh, that, relate, that relate the two. What's curious is that uh, AX is related, related to AX prime by a division of a gamma cube, do the arithmetic, while, while the component of the acceleration in the transverse direction is related to its component in the other frame S prime by a division of a different power of gamma, gamma squared. So even in this special case, the acceleration in the frame S is not even parallel to the, to the uh, acceleration in the other frame in general, because you get different scaling weights between the two, between the, the various components. So it's, it's really quite tricky. It leads to some interesting uh, uh, geometric uh, uh, effects in, in, in relativity. Okay, and then some of those are discussed in, uh, in the textbook. Okay, so we, we can look at that. Acceleration is a little bit daunting. But now let's, let's turn to what we're really interested in related to this is the transformation property of forces from S to S prime. Well, I can, I can do that now as, as well. It's just a matter of putting together all the ingredients. I have all the ingredients at my disposal. Okay. We know that, we know that the, the force is the time rate of change of the momentum, where the momentum is a relativistic momentum. I know that momentum is gamma mv, okay? And the relativistic energy is gamma mc squared. And so I can calculate the force in one frame and transform to another frame, because I know how p prime transformed from one frame to the other. I know how t prime transformed from one frame to the other. In particular, I write that down here. Here's the, trans the Lorentz transformation for momentum. Here's the Lorentz transformation for energy. And I, and I have it right here. So for example, I can take this formula for the force in, in the frame S prime and just calculate it in terms of quantities in the frame S. Just apply the Lorentz transformations. So dP prime, just take the differential of this fellow and I've written it down here. And then downstairs, dt prime, take the differential of it. Well, I did that in the acceleration case. I just steal that formula again. Okay. And, and so uh, then I get this formula that, that f prime is equal to f minus v over c squared dE dt, where e is the, is the uh, uh, relativistic energy. And then I have uh, a factor downstairs that I've come to expect that is all in, in all of these nonlinear transformation laws. Uh, but this is a little bit perplexing. I, uh, I, I don't get a, a formula that just involves forces. I also get a f the power comes into, the, into it, the rate of change, the time rate of change of the energy. So I need the EDT. I see that the lesson I learned at this point is transformation law of the force involves the power. How can I get the power? Okay, well, that's not so tough. Uh, because I, I know equations for the energy, and I can relate that to forces. Here, I begin by writing down the energy-momentum relationship, okay? So I can relate it to momentum, okay? Once I relate it to momentum, then I can relate it to force when I take a time derivative. So that's the way to go. So, so write down E squared equals P squared plus M squared. Put the factors of C in there appropriately. Take the time derivative of it, so dE squared dt, that's twice E dE dt. And on the right-hand side, then I just have V by dt of this term, P squared, and I've written that down here. Okay, this term is a constant, doesn't contribute to the time derivative. Okay, so I can take this, uh, take this equation, okay, and solve for dE dt, and I get C times momentum over E dotted into three vector dot. Okay, you see it's just uh, momentum dotted into momentum, the three vector dot, dot uh, dp dt. So what do I have over here? Well, I have c, p over e. Well, that's just the velocity of the particle. 
okay? Uh, remember, for example, yeah, just take the ratio of these two guys, P over E, you see the gammas cancel, and I get just the velocity over C squared. And so I'm just writing that down here. And then I get dP by dt, oh, that's just the force. And so I see that the rate of change of the energy is the force times the velocity. That sounds just like Newtonian physics, right? Right? That, that, that the power that's generated is just the force times the velocity, right? The work done is force times distance, and so the rate at work, work is done is force times velocity. And I just derived that now for, in the case of relativity. Easily done. But now you see everywhere I saw here, the e dt, I can replace the e dt by u dot f. Stick it in here. And now, and now I have a more palatable uh, uh, transformation law because it involves just forces, uh, velocities, and, and velocities which, uh, which I expect. Okay. Okay, so, so that's, that's good, but it does involve u dot f. So I really need the transformation law also for u dot f, the e dt, to complete this, uh, this, set of, uh, this set of equations, okay? I, I don't have just the three components of f in it, I also have f dot u. So let's see how f dot u uh, transforms from one frame, from one frame uh, to the other. Okay, and that's done here. Well, that, it's easy to do. Uh, u dot f is just, is just uh, the e dt. And so I'm just going to look at the e prime dt prime. Okay, just like I did in the previous case for the momentum. E prime, I know how that transforms. I can do the numerator. I know how dt transforms. I do the denominator. Okay, and so, and so I, I, I see on the right-hand side the e dt. I see the p dt. I know that the e dt is u dot f. And I know that the p dt is just v. And so I've got it. Okay, so so the e prime dt prime, that's f prime dot u prime, and that's equal to uh, upstairs f dot u, and then minus v dot f in the x direction, and then my denominator that comes along for the ride. Okay, and so now, so now I have therefore the transformation properties for forces. Okay. The transformation property doesn't close if I just consider the three components of the force. I also have to look and, and see how the power transforms. That's equivalent to looking at how u dot, the, I mean velocity dot force uh, transforms. And, and so that's my complete set of four transformation laws to understand how forces transform from one, from one situation to the other. Now one of the things I, I, I really should, should uh, harp on here to discuss in more detail is the character of the equation I found, right? What did I find? I found that the force here, F prime, is related to the force a X by a, a bunch of terms that involve velocity, okay? So remember, in Newton's world, you could have a force like gravity or a force like electrostatic forces, okay? And they depended on positions of particles and never velocities. We see that that's impossible in relativity. Because if in relativity, if you suppose that that was the case in one frame, you can transform to another frame, and the forces are going to be velocity dependent. See, his, his F prime depends upon the velocity u, okay, of, of, of the particle. So, so, uh, so velocity dependent forces are forced upon us by relativity. The idea that, that forces are, are velocity independent is inconsistent with Lorentz transformations. And this is going to be the, this is going to be the source of magnetism. Okay? That velocity dependent forces are essential. Electric forces aren't the whole story. Static forces or forces that just depend upon position are not the whole story because relativity forces on them. Uh, forces that depend upon the velocity of the particle. That's just in here. But you also learn something deeper than that. This is true for any kind of force. It's not a property just of electromagnetism. Gravity is going to have the same thing. Quantum electrodynamics is going to have the same thing. The dark forces that hold the universe together have got to have the same thing. Okay. 
so so we so in, in gravity we talk about uh, gravitomagnetic forces, velocity dependent forces. It's not a particularly great term because because uh, because it suggests that gravity has the same kind of magnetism as as electromagnet as, as as electricity magnetism, and that's not true, okay? Because we'll see that gravity is a is a force dependent upon is a tensor force, not a vector force, and so there'll be some interesting differences there. But the presence of a velocity dependence in the force is forced upon us by relativity, and that's certainly true. Details details depend upon the specific force law, but the velocity dependence does not. Okay, so now we can, so now we can talk about the death of Newton's third law and static forces and the birth of fields. Okay, so in Newton's law, as we've seen, F is Galilean variant, depends only on the distances between particles and has no velocity dependence. Gra uh, think of Newton's law of gravity. Okay, force between two gravitating masses is a gravitational constant, mass of one of them, mass of the other one, divided by r squared times the, the, times the unit vector between them. It doesn't depend on how they're moving, right? Here you've got, you got the moon, uh, well you, let's say you have the sun, you have the earth here, they're moving, okay? But the force between them only depends upon the position uh, between them at that particular instant in, in the frame of interest, okay? That's Newtonian physics, that's impossible. In, in relativity. But in, in Newton's world, that's the way it works, and these features uh, lead to Newton's third law of action-reaction. One thing we want to remember is that action-reaction is a non-local non conservation law, right? The, the Earth pulls on the Moon with the same force that the Moon pulls on the Earth, but those two forces are separate, they're 239,000 miles apart, and they act simultaneously. Okay, so, so let's see the inconsistency uh, of action-reaction uh, in relativity. Suppose Newton's law, third law holds in a frame S. So in that, in that frame, one particle pushes on the other, uh, and the other particle pushes back, and the sum of those two forces is zero. So that means, in my Minkowski diagram, in the frame S, where the time axis is T, okay, that, that instantaneously at the same t, we have a, a force of particle two acting on one, which is equal and opposite to the force of particle one acting on two. So we have the four, you know, th these two forces of attraction, say, uh, e are equal and opposite, but they're at different points, okay? So let's view that situation in a, in a, in a movie frame S prime and show it on a Minkowski diagram. So here's the time axis for S prime. Is the x prime axis for the frame s prime. Now the, the lines of equal time in the in the, in s prime are not uh, are, are not parallel to x. They're parallel to x prime. Okay, so these are the lines of, of, of equal time. Ah, so so we see here that from the perspective of s prime, action and reaction are not acting at the same time. There's a period of time in between. Okay. Where you don't, where they're not equal enough, they're not, they're not equal and opposite only because they're acting at different times. Okay, the two forces are not uh, are not canceling out uh, because as as I move up in in in, uh, in t prime, I come up upon a, a, you know particle two before I come up come upon a particle particle one or, or the or, you know or the positions the t the time uh, positions where these forces are acting. Right, these forces are acting simultaneously in the frame S, okay, but they're separated in distance, and so from the perspective of the frame S prime, they're not, it's, they're not uh, occurring at the, sa at the same time at all, and so you don't have uh, uh, momentum conservation. You don't have the third law acting, uh, acting appropriately, and, and the third law fails, and momentum conservation fails. So that's the that's the uh, that's the, the the thing that we that, that we learn, and we're going to have to uh, and we're going to have to deal with that uh, as, as we go forward. So we see that the Newton's idea of action at a distance, instantaneous uh, forces in a particular frame, is 
is inconsistent uh, with, with relativity. The conservation law, non-local conservation laws, are not conservation laws at all. They're frame dependent. Okay. So, so now we're at a real impasse, okay? You can ask, are there any circumstances where Newton's third law could hold? Well, we get into trouble if these two points are separate. But we don't get into trouble if those two points are coincident, right? If the, if the particles are banging off of, off of one another. See, because in that, in that case, momentum conservation becomes a local conservation law, and you evade this problem. If you have a local conservation law, okay, then you don't have uh, the separation between the two points where the forces were equal in, in, in uh, Newton's, Newton's uh, world, and, and so you evade that, the, those times where, where uh, the, uh, okay, you evade, you evade those times between those, those two points where you're, you're clearly out of, uh, out of conservation, where you're not, you're not conserving, you're not conserving momentum, okay. But, so if we can, if we can make a, a theory where all of the interactions are local, okay, then we could have the conservation law and we could have the hope of, uh, of having momentum conservation. We have to give up the idea of instantaneous electric forces and, and replace it with, with something else. And the something else we're going to replace it with is the electromagnetic field. Okay, it's going to interact locally uh, with the charged particles. So our picture of interactions is now going to change to a much more interesting dynamical affair. It's going to say that two separated charged particles interact with each other through a dynamical electromagnetic field. So the particle at, 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 at position R1 to T1 will interact with the field there, the field that's around it, and then that field will broadcast that information to the, to the particle at position R2 and T2 Okay, where another particle might might experience its effects. Okay, so I have a particle. I have a particle over here. It's a charged particle. It, it carries this electromagnetic field around with it. Okay, okay, and so it it might let's say jiggle jiggle around and change its position. Okay, I have a particle back over here. It does it doesn't communicate instantaneously with with that particle. Okay, but what could what could happen is that the the, the, the uh, position of this, of this particle could be transmitted to the other one through, through the intermediate electromagnetic field at a velocity of light. So if their distance between them was L, after a duration of L over C, the second particle could, could experience the fact that this one is here moving about and it could react to it, okay? So, so, so to, save, uh, to save momentum conservation, will say that we have we do have conservation it's a mo it's a local conservation law and the momentum of this particle is trans transferred to this field which that which then propagates it out uh, to the other particle deposits some momentum on that on that other particle moving it moving it in some particular moving it in some particular way okay again conserving momentum up here at the second particle and uh, and, and and so we can we can uh, make uh, so we, we take the instantaneous interaction through a static field, replace it as the non instantaneous propagating uh, interaction through a dynamical field. The conservation laws become local, and maybe we can save the day. Okay, that's the idea that comes across from, uh, from relativity. This is how you're going to have to uh, reformulate. The price you pay is, of course, the electromagnetic field now becomes a dynamical variable, right? In Newton's world, we had a force, an electrostatic force, and we introduced the, electro, the, the, the electric field just as a shortcut, just force divided by charge. If you tell me where the charge is at any time, I know where the electric field is everywhere, okay? You can think of that as a constraint equation. Tell me the charge, I'll tell you the electric field everywhere. Once I know the electric field everywhere, I know the acceleration everywhere. The electric field must be Galilean invariant because the uh, acceleration is Galilean invariant, and that's the end of the story. Well, we lose all of that stuff when we come to relativity, but we gain the idea that the electromagnetic field becomes a dynamical variable, and we're going to have to find out in its equation of motion. And of course, that's the task ahead of us. 
and we learned that this field must carry energy and momentum because we want energy and momentum to be local conservation laws because they can be, local conservation laws can be consistent with relativity. They can be true in every frame. Okay, it's propagation we will be subject to the speed limit C. Interactions in relativistic theory should be formulated in terms of local causal events. That's what we're shooting for, okay? And that's really the beginnings of, of field theory and the death knell of, uh, of Newtonian physics. So that's where we'll, we'll pick it up here uh, the next time. We'll start looking at the electromagnetic field ar around the charged particle, and we'll, we'll start looking at how charged particles uh, interact through electric and will derive magnetic uh, forces from, from, those, uh, from those concepts. So that will be uh, uh, lecture seven, which will consist of a, of a few parts, and we'll, 